Okay, yeah. okay, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm good, I'm starting. <laughs> um, so I'm here right now with Carolyn North, who's a wonderful friend to the community, a friend to the world, a friend to me. Really happy to be able to say that. Uh, celebrating this beautiful new work of art that just launched uh, this week. Um, what's the name of it? It's called World Shift Happens. Uh, facing down the fear, waking up the mind. And um, there's so many amazing stories in this book and around the book, but I wanted you to share, first of all, um, the serendipity of even getting it published and how, it, how that happened, how that piece of it happened. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's a great story, a sort of unbelievable story. Um, and that was that about two months ago, I made a call to somebody here in California and got somebody in New Jersey. But I didn't get just somebody, I got a, a woman who was a good friend and a publisher of mine uh, over 10 years ago. And I asked for my friend here, who's a young man, and got this woman of my age, <laughs> who was on the other side of the country, thought, what's going on? And so we caught up with each other because we recognized each other's voice. And then in the course of our conversation, I realized I had this manuscript, which I had written 12 years ago, and it had never been published. And it's about the world shift time. I was a bit ahead of my time at the time, but now was indeed the time. So I said, Brenda, I have a manuscript. Um, would you like to see it? Anyhow, and then it all rolled out. She did. I sent, I sent it in, in manuscript form. She said, oh my goodness, yes, let's do it. And let's do it for Christmas. So it came out. Um, I got my copies last night. So um, pretty, unex it's like the universe was saying, okay, let's get this into people's hands. It's an important message for our time. And here it is. Well, um, it is. It's really interesting now also that this is out around the time that um, we're going into the new year. And that obviously we're in the, the midst of a pandemic, a global pandemic, and the old systems kind of uh, falling apart in a way. And then we have something that is supporting and, 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 and sharing with folks um, how we got to this place in our world and how we can move forward in a good way. And so what are the main components of what you like to share with people about this? You have anecdotes, you have stories. It's really well written. It's, it's a weave of, of, of stories of your life. And there's also some things in here about um, the world that may possibly, hopefully beautifully be created. The thing I love about it, it's not, so many things around this period are so dystopian. And this mm -hmm. is so hopeful. It's so rich. Um, it's fun. It's spooky a little bit because it's so, because you wrote it 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, how did you, like, how are you aware intuitively of all these things that, you know, people would need to know right now, which are really going to support people, I believe. Mm -hmm. I hope so. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, basically, I wanted to do three things. And the first was sort of philosophical. Like, we have a society that seems to be based on uh, a very old paradigm that is an unworking paradigm. And it's been unworking from my point of view, certainly economically and racially for thousands of years. So I wanted to address that. I also wanted to address the whole issue of fear because a lot of the, the um, real insanity that is going on, I think is based on a very deep, deep sitting fear in our human soul. And, and essentially what it is, I think, is a fear of death. Mm -hmm. So um, I wanted to address that fear of death, uh, which, and I had already written all of this for another book that I wrote about the death and dying process uh, a couple of years ago that the publisher would not put in because it was mm -hmm. you know, too scary, basically. Mm -hmm. And then what I wanted to do was to imagine the world after the inevitable breakdown of this time and, ima and imagine how the survivors would put together the world according to a very different basic understanding of the nature of reality and how we should live on the earth amongst one another. So the book is comprised of those three issues. So it's the philosophy, uh, the issue of death and dying in which what I wanted to show 
was that our fear of it is un unfounded and that it's just part of a cycle and the whole, the whole earth and the whole universe goes in continual cycles. So, you know, dying does not mean the end of anything except a particular cycle. So it's not the end of us uh, as individuals or even as a species from what I have learned um, and then, and then the um, the the utopia. But but let me say another thing about this. Um, uh, well, I will ask me a I, question. I, I do. I am interested in the difference between like pre-COVID, pre-pandemic. Uh, like we're standing right here right now. It's um, December, what, 17th, 18th. 18th. We just got this thing on the phone, like everyone go home. It's, you know, it's, it's an emergency alert. Like we're living in this really weird time. We're in the same community, just so everyone knows, um, same pod. But pre-COVID, the publishers kind of being afraid even of the chapters on death and dying. Um, it's important to me and my work because I realize a lot of, like you were saying, echoing what you were saying about people being really, really afraid of life because we're afraid of transitioning and living in a capitalist society, material, 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 material society, where we've been convinced, kind of hoodwinked into thinking that this, this is it. When in reality, you know, when you were, when people, permaculturists and people work with nature and people, indigenous folks and black people who work with the land and folks who are connected, understanding with the, the, the cycles of life, birth and, and transition that we continue to move forward. So my question is, um, what do you think was different 12 years out? You think it was the pandemic and the, the fact that now people need- <laughs> They need this. <laughs> this is the medicine. <laughs> this is your medicine, folks. Like really, I've been reading it. It's really, and I know when I love you and your stories are incredible and you're incredible and just such a gem, um, really. Uh, Hale was saying that like, oh my God, this is so cool that you're gonna have this conversation. But what do you think, do you think people are ready to move from the fear of transitioning to really trying to embrace the totality, the wholeness mm -hmm. of the gift that we have in this life? Well, I think some people are, and I think many people are, not everybody. Um, however, it's that or we go down. You know, we have, to, we have to take it on. We have to have the courage to face reality. And reality, has, I mean, a lot of the structure of our society is not based on reality. It's based, I don't know what it's based on, but you know, like the profit motive is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And the, the notion that, that some people can own parts of the earth, like who thought that one up? It's, um, it's, it's not real, but what's happening and that excites me very much is that the young people, the ones who have been started getting born, I don't know, 30 years ago or so, uh, are just, I think, I don't know what it is that their soul age is more mature or they are coming in with, for a reason, but they are showing up. Uh, the, the young ones just blow my mind and they are ready for this. Well, you have, um, you have two, local peace economy pro two local peace economy projects that I wanna uh, take a moment to highlight. And one is the um, Daily Bread Mm -hmm. And the other one that you're working on and engaged in right now is um, an eldering and transition um, project that's actually happening right here where we are, mm -hmm. um, I guess, in, a, in, in partnership with Wild and Radish or in, you know, in, in support with and uh, by Wild and Radish. And if you could talk about that, because it's really important. And I felt pieces of it. I feel pieces of it in some of the stories that are here. Mm -hmm. I understand why you would um, embark on a project like that. Um, after having read a lot of this and your understanding of, of, of wanting to have a beautiful transition and have a transition that is, you know, relates to who you are, who you've been and the work that you've done on the planet. Well, thank you. I, I think it's also so important to be able to face death and dying. And we don't in this society, nor do we face aging. My goodness. And one of the reasons I'm here was the thought of going into a nursing home it's like i'll kill myself first can you but, tell people what, the, what 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 this is what the project is what this is <laughs> <laughs> well and i met these people 10 years ago about the time that i completed this book um mm. i was interested I've, I've been interested for a long time in 
how do we bring the generations together? That plus how do we get smart about the fact that we're not here forever? And we have a society that isn't smart about either of those. So <clears throat> I, I, that's a great story actually. So I was, <clears throat> I was complaining to a friend one day that uh, I really wanted to, I wanted to start something that involved elders and what they could offer to a community and youngers and what they could offer to a community and put it together. And she said, oh my God, I know them. And she called out these, <laughs> these folks who we now call the radishes. And, they, and she said, there's somebody you have to meet. <laughs> and so um, we set up a meeting time literally for the next morning. And it was a rainy day and they had just bought this land. And so I met them. And um, I, I was so impressed. I, I remember this wonderful, it's actually a great story and it's not in the book. Um, I, I asked them, well, they were describing what they were going to do here. And they, there was, they, were, they had 10 acres and they were gonna put five acres into, into a, a permaculture food forest. And, <clears throat> and uh, you know, I looked at, I was with three of them or four of them and, and they're talking about planting 700 trees. And I'm thinking, oh, these poor kids, they don't know what they're getting into. <laughs> So I asked probably in a pretty disrespectful way, and who's gonna do the work? <laughs> and <laughs> they explained to me that they'd been teaching gardening in San Quentin. And part of the reason they were doing it and part of what they wanted uh, to, to prepare people for was when they came out and give them a a métier that they could actually make money at, which was doing gardens in people's houses. So they were teaching these folks to actually come out and those were the people who would put in the farm. I realized, wow, I was not prepared for this level of wisdom. And I said, okay, I trust you. I trust you, let me work with you. And so I have been in fact working with them um, in a working is probably too strong a word. I've been assisting financially and assisting because I'm just an older person with more experience than most of them have had in all the things that you get experienced in when you're a wife and a mother for years. So- um, <clears throat> you, said, you said at one point that you felt um, almost like out on a limb in the project, you said that before. And so you're here now, the space is gorgeous. It's a beautiful space. Um, the way that your mind and your abilities have kind of coalesced with these folks who are younger, as you talked about, um, it, 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 it's materialized a lot of the things that you that were imagining. Mm -hmm. And so um, my question is, how do you feel in the day to day and, 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 and your vision for moving forward mm -hmm. and, you know, later with, with this? How's it going, in other words? How's it you? going? Yeah. Well, that's a, a very interesting and valid <laughs> question because I moved in at the beginning of the shut of the lockdown. So, uh, and this room that you can see sort of behind us, it used to be the old garage and it's now a, a perfect size studio apartment for a single person. I think two people could even live here if necessary, they'd have to really get along. Yeah. <laughs> um, so how do we all get along? Uh, it's, I would say basically well, um, and it's amazing that we do, um, partly because uh, we, <laughs> we have to wear masks and we can't laugh together and we can't stand too close to each other except when we do. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, it's, a, it's an amazing group of people and we have recently taken on, I say we, I mean, I'm, I'm a recent come oner, um, uh, but we want a diversified community. And so, uh, and everybody's got a friend who he or she would like to have here. And so we've sort of brought our friends together 
and then we're all behind masks and yeah. all, <laughs> all trying to figure out how to do this crazy thing. And so now we're coming into winter. Um, so the activity on the farm itself will be changing. And I, you know, I mean, it's, I live day to day and mm. more and more um, get to know people. Um, I'm older than everybody else. And so it's, it's a little, you know, it's taken a while for us to find one another in a way, a way like, what is my role? I'm this old lady in the middle of all these wonderful young people. Like, what do I do? Am I one of them? Am I grandma? Am I the wise woman sitting in, in the garage? <laughs> I don't know yet. But, um, but I think what is building just in the, whatever it is, four months I've been here, is uh, esteem and love. Mm -hmm. I, I love these people. I'm astonished by them. And I'm also astonished by their children. So um, the kids, you know, gravitate towards me very easily. And now we're all doing it in masks. But, um, but we dance together and we talk and they tell me about their friends and they make poop jokes and all that sort of stuff. And I'm perfect, you know, I'm the perfect foil for, for these kids. And their parents and, <clears throat> and their friends, I mean, I feel very, very fortunate to have landed here, uh, especially as many of my, my cohort, you know, mm. people, I'm, I just mm -hmm. turned 83. So, um, you know, people my age are ill and dying. Um, and some of them are in nursing homes of mm. one sort or another, ill and dying. You said that you didn't want to go into, you didn't want to go that route. And so do you yeah. feel, and in my own, in my personal life right now, I'm witnessing a lot of folks who are um, transitioning or who are, who are in the seventies or in their late mid to mid seventies and thinking about, um, you know, how they want to um, spend the last, you know, few really great years of their lives mm -hmm. moving into their eighties, nineties, one hundreds. Um, so what you're doing, because you're in it, it's not like you're thinking about it, you're in the space, mm -hmm. you're in this time of your life. Do you feel living into this idea as it's materialized? How does that feel? Is that, is that a great feeling? Is it a scary feeling? Is it like, what am I doing? Or is it <laughs> wonderful for you? It's all of the above, really. Um, mostly it's wonderful. And mostly it's very uh, satisfying because one of the things one of, I think, my purposes on the planet is to try and get at the fear of death. Mm -hmm. And so if I can actually demonstrate aging and getting frailer and eventually dying and do it as a very natural thing, do it, you know, do it deliberately as opposed to being a victim of it, then hopefully I can teach by just demonstration. By being about being, yeah. yeah just being. But just being you know yeah. a, you know a lady who's getting older and older and uh, needs more and more help like the other night i took my first fall it was a very exciting moment <laughs> like, carol's oh. a dancer though too so carolyn <laughs> probably falls better than most of us so well, i have to say that well i didn't break anything so. but um but it, it was it was it was very uh heartwarming because there were what three folks who happened to be sort of around. And I fell partly because there were also three dogs and they were bouncing all over the place. And it was night and I couldn't see where I was walking. So I tripped and um, my goodness, they were there like this. And if I had allowed them to, they would have, you know, all gotten together, dogs and all, picked me off the ground, you know, made sure I had no broken bones. I wouldn't let them, I insisted upon you know, them standing there, but letting me lean on them rather than them lifting me. But I thought, okay, here we go. This is your first fall and it won't be the last one. And, um, you know, nobody's gonna run away. How important is it for people to have loving community? How important is it for us to have loving community around us at any juncture of our lives, but especially as mm -hmm. we're aging? Um, it's the most important thing in the world, I think, and it's family. It's, uh, and we are, we are social creatures and we live, so many of us live isolated lives. 
and are uh, depressed and are taking pills for their depression. And, um, you know, we're not meant to be alone at any age unless we choose to be. You know, I'm a writer, so I have to be alone um, a part of the time and don't want constant company. But living in a community where people are concerned, are watching me and concerned for my welfare and um, grateful for my experience and, um, and for what I do have to offer is, feels exactly right. Um, I come from, I have three children and my marriage lasted for over half a century. And we had a big brown shingle house in Berkeley, uh, two story, and uh, there I was, you know, when the children all left and then my husband died a few years ago. It was like me in this big family house. And it was crazy, you know, I mean, it's dangerous. I, I it was really dangerous. And I, uh, I took in some tenants just because I was curious to know what that was like and um, didn't like it. You know, I was living with strangers and they were living in what had been my home for mm -hmm. half a century and didn't do things my way. It was my <laughs> home. Like, wait a minute, you got to wash your dishes before you leave for work. <laughs> Wow, I'm getting a glimpse of what that was probably like for all of you. Right. It wasn't it wasn't <laughs> ideal. So I got okay, you know, tried that out and learned some important things. And living there alone uh, was not possible. I mean, it was dangerous for me. So, you know, it all kind of worked over time that I in fact moved to a community, get to know, and then I had 10 years before I actually moved here to get to know these people. And, um, and we worked together on, uh, on building projects, which is, you know, how this garage turned into a, a living space. A really cool spot, a really, really cool spot to live. There, there's a piece in here at the end. Um, it's the third piece, the third and final uh, piece of the book, mm -hmm. where you describe a really wonderful, um, world where people are living together the babies are born naturally at home and they're raised with animals and they're you know the elders are a part of the community and it's it's it feels natural it's romantic it's sweet it's real too it's not like you know not uh, without its realism is that what you sense that's your dream or you're speaking out into the field of consciousness the collective field of what you want to see happen? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I'm, if it's my book, I can say whatever I want. So uh, that I was describing what for me would be uh, an ideal life. Mm -hmm. And I got mm -hmm. many of my clues, uh, well, just from my imagination, but also from here and from mm -hmm. my brother, I actually, my, my brother was, he just died, which is, I'm still not used to, but um, he was a farmer in Vermont mm -hmm. and had, on the most gorgeous farm. And it was owned collectively by a group of people. And it was always my ideal of how people should live together. And so I, I cited in my, my fiction, I put this community on my brother's farm without saying so. And, um, and, then, uh, and then made up the story uh, and made up the people. And what I was trying to illustrate was all the, the variation, the possible variations of ways to live when we finally get rid of this fossil fuel nonsense. And when we recognize that the earth is not to be owned by anybody and uh, figure out ways to live on the earth together, feed ourselves, get along with one another, teach our children, etc., and die. Yeah, yeah. So this uh, is um, this is this is a really cool, amazing um, project. This is a great book. I am excited about it because I feel that, like, when I talk to people, first of all, I've been living in California, I guess, for 15 years, and so when I talk to them, that's a trip unto itself. 
But when I talk to my friends back in the Midwest or New York City, it's like I'm on another planet. <laughs> like the things here that we take, the consciousness that we take for granted and the conversations that we have mm -hmm. um, kind of put me like, I feel like I'm out here, out here somewhere talking mm -hmm. when I talk to my people back home. But when I read this, it gives me a lot of, um, it's encouraging because I know I could give this book to any one of my friends, um, anyone, anyone. Um, and from at, regardless of the walk of life, um, whether they're completely in like smack dab in the middle of the mate, what we call the matrix. Um, everyone right now, I think on the planet is thinking about like what next, like what's gonna happen. Like we're moving into this unknown. So I kind of feel like this is just wonderful because as I read it, I think like, wow, anyone could pick this up and, and, and read it and find a place of entry and understand because you kind of go into like, you know, where the world that we're living in right now, like how it was, you know, kind of pulled together. And then the bamboozling of losing some of the most essential pieces of our, of ourselves through, you know, having to like, you know, make, make, make it happen, make it happen, make things happen. Um, there's another important piece of this, which is also moves through like a lot of our conversations, but it's daily bread, mm -hmm. which is the, um, and I want to kind of wrap up talking about that which is the um, local peace economy project that you started once again, way before it's time or just on time. Um, can you tell us about Daily Bread and, and where, what's happening with it now and when you started and some really beautiful stories that you have about that? Hmm. Yeah, <laughs> I'd love to talk about Daily Bread. Well, um, it's now in its 40th year and it's, um, it's an all volunteer project without a budget. So this was 1982 or three or something. And it was um, Thanksgiving time. I mean, it's a real story. Thanksgiving time, I was walking down the street in my neighborhood and uh, noticed in my neighbor's garbage cans, the, um, the turkey carcasses. I mean, people were kind of like, oh, I can't stand turkey anymore. And they just threw it away. And I came home, I was pretty shocked by it actually, because I was always, you know, the one who took the carcass and made soup out of it and made fritters out of it and made everything. Right on. <laughs> um, so so I, was, I was shocked. So I asked my husband, who was the, a scientist and a numbers guy, okay, we have so and so many houses on our street. <clears throat> if every, every house on both sides of just our street throughout their turkey carcasses, how much turkey would that be that was being wasted? And, um, and so he did the math and it was outrageous. I mean, it was pounds and pounds and pounds of perfectly good edible protein that everybody was unconsciously just tossing out. I said, that's not okay. So I dreamed up this, and I just had this idea, what if, a bunch of volunteers in the neighborhoods, you know, in the city um, would be willing to make runs of food that was wasted in the food businesses. So all the things that get thrown into dumpsters, you know, yesterday's bread and, and things that, that their, their pull dates are over that, you know, people go dumpster diving because they're hungry. This is for the most part, perfectly good food. Um, how about if instead of dumping it, we, a couple of us, me and my friends basically, went around to some of the businesses we had a connection with and said, instead of you're throwing it into the dumpster, could we come and pick it up once a week? And um, many of them, not all, some were afraid of the legal stuff, but many of them said, oh sure, we hate throwing it out. Mm. So, um, that was the beginning and it started with uh, a restaurant and a bakery in my neighborhood and also a food kitchen in my neighborhood and two people me i was one of the runners and a friend of mine was one of the runners and so and this friend of mine also worked for the berkeley gazette at the time which dates me of course um, but that was the local newspaper and so uh we put a little notice in the newspaper and said, we are thinking of doing this. Does anybody want to join us? And um, set a date uh, and a time and a place. This was my backyard. 
And lo and behold, there was a mob there. <laughs> it's like, whoa, <laughs> what if we started? And, um, and everybody wanted, not only did everybody want to do, to be a runner, we call them runners, but um, they knew somebody who owned a bakery or they knew somebody who worked mm. at the, the Berkeley Co-op, mm. which used to be, um, or you know, had some source mm. of food. And, um, and so we made a list and who could do it on Wednesday, who could do it on Thursday. And we were actually up and running in 12 days. And, and it was all volunteer. And what I realized is we didn't need anything. We didn't need money. We didn't need trucks. We didn't need refrigerators. We didn't need anything. We just needed people who were willing to make a run, say every Tuesday morning at nine o'clock, they would show up at such and such a restaurant, grab the food, get it over to a food pantry. There was also, I had to do some research and find out you know, where the, where the food uh, giveaway programs were operating in Berkeley. And there we were, you know, less than two weeks later, we were doing it and, um, and it grew. And um, people heard around, we didn't advertise anything. We didn't do anything, it was just word of mouth. Mm -hmm. um, and before we knew it, uh, <laughs> reporters were coming and wanted my story. And then it, the stories were getting out in and this was before social media in the 80s. It's, so we didn't have this. Mm -hmm. um, but the stories were getting out and people were calling me from all over the country. Can you tell us how you did it? Mm -hmm. So I wrote up how we did it and said, you know, do it in a way that's relevant for your community. And, um, and don't use our name, use your own name. And currently, I mean, I mean, it's now, this is how many years later, it's 40 years later. So now the, the saving of food is, uh, I heard recently that it's actually illegal in France for a food business to dump its food. That's amazing. It is, uh, it is amazing. And now, you know, we just, we're still doing it because we're still doing it. Um, but it's also happening all over the place. And it's so obvious, you wonder why it took this long. Well, I do, I do a lot of, um, thank you for that story, that amazing story. Um, I do a lot of food distribution and a lot of food prep work and a lot of, and I, what, I'm, what I'm seeing is, is that the numbers of people who are doing it, it seems like it's, there's certain ilk of people who are involved and engaged with the work. And it seems like the numbers of folks who are doing it. I'm wondering, I'm fascinated because I'm wondering if whether the psychic space of Americans has changed to the extent where, you know, now people say, oh, that's such wonderful work, Kelly. That's really wonderful of you to do that. But it's not really, they're not really feeling themselves necessarily. And some people are, we have a lot of wonderful people who volunteer, folks who work on, you know, the project that we have here. But I'm really heartened by your story. It would seem like Carolyn and I met through that, but that's not how we met. We met through you know, these other projects that are going on. But that's an amazing story. Daily Bread is something that you can actually look up online right now and there's actually a photograph of you um on the on the web page oh, really? from, yeah from the you were standing in the kitchen in the church in the church i oh. think in east oakland with some sisters no, McGee Avenue Baptist. It's, okay see yes. <laughs> <laughs> yep yep yeah. you're there so um thank you thank you for that oh. um i, I want to continue talking with you um at another time i want to thank you for your book this is really an amazing book i i, I don't actually have a copy and i was like we're well, this reading is your it. present. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I'm excited. Because I was reading it on my phone and like, you know, the advanced, like, you know, the, the manuscript. And I really feel like um, it's a piece for the heart. Mm. It's a piece, like many pieces speak to our mind around what's next, what we can do. But this actually weaves such beautiful stories. And it makes, it's like, I just see people with a cup of hot tea with their family, or even reading some of the stories to your kids. It's just really marvelous. And thank you for this. Oh my and congratulations, goodness. girl, because it's out now everywhere. Well, and um, she's, you, you stay with me, baby. <laughs> we'll check in again. We're gonna check because this this is like a work in progress, like the um the space with wild and radish and other things. We'll check in again though on what's going on here. I just want to let you know I love you. I think I'm appreciative to you. So many stories of Carolyn, y'all. You'll never believe how I first saw Carolyn. It was in a dream. 
that's another that's for another that's time right. but thank you everyone uh have a beautiful day local peace economy forever and take it easy thank you local peace economy forever <laughs> <laughs> ciao ciao